Some great wise person said, be curious, not judgmental. Be curious and not judgmental. Do you know who said that? Anyone know? You did. <laughs> no. I mean, I just said it. But no, it's Ted Lasso. And Ted Lasso is a television show. It's hard to see because it's on Apple. But we actually got Apple just so we could see it. Great show. I cannot hide and recommend it enough. And he has this line, be, be curious, not judgmental. What's funny is the character, played by Jason Sudeikis, says that it comes from Walt Whitman. But Jason Sudeikis later clarifies in an interview, Walt Whitman never actually said that. It was a local minister, but nobody knew the minister, so in that he had the character attribute it to Walt Whitman, <laughs> just to give it some oomph. Be curious, not judgmental. What if we are just curious? We're on this incredible spiritual journey, and there's so many different pieces to it. What if we just looked at it and were curious about it without having to judge it as bad or good? It sort of opens us up. So I've been curious because we've been talking about curiosity all month, and I'm like, what else do I have to say about curiosity? I was quite curious about today. <laughs> so the two topics that came forth to talk about are two topics that either one could be uh, a full, a full four-week four series. So I'm, I'm just looking at the clock because I have to make stop myself. Because it's a topic that all of us, a lot of us, are interested in and know. There's many in here that know a lot about. So it's interesting. It's got some juice to it. But, I, but I, I'm looking at it from the framework of curiosity and patience and faith. Really what pa came through was curiosity with patience and faith. But the topic for today was curiosity out loud. So we'll begin with that, curiosity out loud. Curiosity out loud is when you're curious about something and you, we were talking about sort of exploring that, looking deeply into it. But curiosity out loud is inviting other people into the conversation. So you're not just being curious on your own, you're just having uh, conversations with other people and opening up to that curiosity. And so I had a wonderful experience of this this past week. I am facilitating a t treatment and meditation class on Tuesday nights. And it's such an awesome class. And we started talking about treatment. Oh, I should probably say. So treatment, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is just a form of prayer, but it's a specific structure to prayer. So if I were to say, in the, you know, if in the Christian tradition, there's the Lord's Prayer. And so it's not just a prayer that has the name Lord in it. We know when we say the Lord's Prayer, it's a very specific prayer. Well, treatment isn't as specific in terms of definite words, but it has a definite structure. And so when we say treatment, we're still talking about a form of prayer that's connection in, through, and as pure spirit, but it has a definite structure. And that's a form of a structure that we teach here at Centers for Spiritual Living. So we're having a class on it, and these great questions are coming up and inquiries, and it got me thinking. <laughs> I'm like, huh, it's interesting. Like, when did treatment begin? Why do we call it a treatment? All these different things. And I thought I had the answer, so I'm giving vague answers. Oh, by the way, I was way wrong on some of them. Dates, way off. I'll explain it. <laughs> so, but what I did then, because I... I can either just like look up the answers myself, but what I chose to do is at the end of the week, I put it out on the minister's listserv because I'm in a community full of people who do treatment, the structure of prayer, and have been doing it for decades. So what better group to ask? So I'm asking about the history. When So we have in our, generally the way we teach treatment, the structure has five steps, and that's the way we teach it in class. But th that came after, Ernest Holmes is the founder of Centers for Spiritual, see, this is how I could say we could talk about this forever. Ernest Holmes is the founder of this teaching, and, but he didn't teach the five steps. So I asked, not only when did the five steps come on board, but if, if I was a student of Ernest Holmes, how would he taught me treatment? 
And so I got the answer. He well, he would have taught three steps at so and so, and then, but then so there were some answers, and then someone said, "Oh, Reverend Jesse Jennings, who, who is the person who created the the curriculum for Essential Earnest, he just did a 90-minute video thing on treatment, the history of treatment." So I watched that all day Saturday, not all day, 90 minutes, going through the history. It's so fascinating. I love it so much because. It, Everything has a reason behind it. Nothing was just sort of, it's not like any of this was slapstick together. It was this deep inquiry to healing, to who we are. So I'll just give you a little bit. Where treatment, the word treatment comes from. So there's a guy named Phineas Quimby. He lived in the early 1800s. And he was interested, he learned a little bit from Frank Mesmer about who was learning about the, they didn't call it the unconscious then, but, or subconscious. But there, there's two, these two minds and so Phineas Quimby started looking at, he, he was a doctor, while well, he was doing it as a healing, he wasn't a doctor, he was he, doing it as a healing modality and learning that, that if people, you could bypass the conscious mind and go straight to the, to the subconscious mind, you could start convincing it of its natural health. That he said the problem is that people have in their subconscious mind ideas that they're not healthy, whole, perfect, and complete. So if you do work at the subconscious level to remind them and teach them, then that healing starts to show up in the conscious mind in the world out there. He liked the word treatment because he was applying it like a doctor applies a treatment. He didn't believe in prayer as he understood it from the, from the Christian tradition. He didn't think it was effective or helpful. <laughs> But he did like this, and, then, and I'm sort of basically saying, and so ultimately, and then it got clarified and deepened along the way. This is what I was reading and hearing about all yesterday. So going back to why do we have five steps? Well, actually, there was three steps, and then the first time Ernest Holmes ever wrote it down was in 1959, and then it was four steps. <laughs> And then someone told his student, he, uh, his student, Oren Moen, I don't know how to say his name, in the early 60s was said, okay, can you make that even more clear, more structured? So he took one of the steps and made it into two, and that's how it became five steps. <laughs> then there's a seven-step treatment where Emma Curtis Hopkins of denial and affirmation, because you know, you affirm something, but then a part of you says, no, that's not true. So then you do a denial, and then you go back to affirmation, so that's a seven-step treatment. <laughs> See, so there's a reasoning behind all of it, and then, and then we're saying, well, how? It's about a shift in consciousness. That's why we like treatment. It's like shifting from, from separation to wholeness. And so some ministers are saying, well, well anyway, it was a whole thing. But what, but what was so fun was that people who have been doing treatments, living treatments, love treatments so much, were writing these really clear understanding of treatment. That, to me, is living a question out loud. I was learning, oh, and by the way, I had other ministers emailing me privately with such cool things I never would have thought of, like an integral understanding of treatment, how to do the Lord's Prayer as a treatment. I mean, just cool stuff. All this stuff, if I had just looked on my own, if I had just been curious on my own, I would have come up with very simple, clear answers. But the creativity and the depth and the wisdom that, that I got to, to, and I'm still, I'm just sort of still letting it all rumble around in my head because I find it so interesting and curious. And what's its relation to prayer and the divine? You know, all of this stuff. When we have a question, a curiosity on our spiritual journey, we can do it on our own, but the joy is actually learning from other people and their experiences because it opens us up. And for me, that's what curiosity out loud looks like. It's fun, it should be playful, because we're curious. We're not coming in and saying, well, this is what I think, because the moment I say that, if I had gone on to the listener and say, well, this is how I perceive it. What do you think? Now it's an argument. It's from what I think to what they think versus a, a question. I'm curious. What do you, how do you see this? How do you teach this? How do you understand this? What's your understanding of our roots or why we do this? It just makes the conversation, it flows. So again, this idea of questions, it's really, I think that it's my favorite thing of this whole month. It's really just beginning to just deepen and deepen this idea the power of questions takes us 
so much deeper, not only in our own life, but with each other, as we explore things together with nobody having the answer, but everyone contributing. I remember listening to a, a gen he taught win-win solutions, and it was really extraordinary, because he said mostly we have win-lose situations, or lose-lose where one person wins and one person loses. So he would go into, and, and I was allowed to sit in and watch of, and he, and I, I remember more actually his, he and his wife's um, example. And I, I wish I could remember it, but they were giving an example where they were at total odds of what they wanted to do with their bedroom. And so she's saying exactly what she wants, and he's saying exactly what they want. And I'm listening to it, I'm like, uh, someone's going to have to give in or compromise. This is, it is un, in my mind, I'm going unsolvable. But the, the two of them are totally committed to win-win, which means that they both get a feeling of winning. And I can't, I wish I could remember the specific example, because I just remember the, the solution to get to win-win blew my mind. Never even occurred to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, and they both got exactly what they want, which seemed utterly impossible. They didn't have to compromise their deepest heart's desires. We can't get there if we're not in communion. So, but, but in order to get to that, they had to be curious. They didn't just stop and say, well, you want this and I want that, and we just stop. Curious, well, how can we do this? How, and just stay in the question. It starts to reveal things that our human minds cannot come up with on our own. Or at least my human mind can't come up with it. But we open to this infinite love intelligence. So that was really good because I talked about treatment in an exact, very short period of time. I spent all day on it yesterday. And then when I was preparing for the talk, I just would go on these long historical <laughs> journeys through treatment. I'm like, no, 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 bring it back. Questions. So I want to talk about visioning. Many of you have heard of visioning. Many of you have practiced visioning. And there's such a power to these questions and to having patience. There's no spiritual practice that you will ever do where you don't have to have patience because spiritual practice is repetition, repetition, repetition. So visioning is a little bit different than visualizing. They're both very powerful, but just to understand the difference, visualizing is when we already have an idea of what we want to see or a feeling and we start visualizing it intentionally, consciously, and I'm sure almost all of you have practiced that and seen the power of that. It, it, it's incredibly powerful. Visioning is where we just open to unconditional love. So our, the basis foundation of our, what, what we believe in, our, in this organization and, and is that there's one power, many names. So all the different religions, everyone, even people who are agnostic and atheists, people who like to be on their own in nature, but behind all of it, doesn't matter what we humanly believe, behind all of us is this one existence, this one pure being. It's invisible. We can't see it, but it's always there. Reverend Russ pointed that to that last week when his, with his um, meditation, with his pointing out instructions. And if you haven't, if you didn't get to be here last week, I invite you to, we have a YouTube channel. Go back and listen, and listen to the, those pointing out instructions because you actually can experience this ever-present I am reality that is ev always here. This always already enlightenment, enlightened self. So that's always there. That's the ground of all being. So it's tapping into that, anchoring ourselves in that, and then asking a question of something we really want to know, and then listening. And now when I say visioning, because someone asked me this, does it mean that you just get a visual? No, you can get sound, you can get smell, you get, but you get feeling. You might not get anything visually, but you have an intuitive knowing or feeling in your body. And that's all visioning is. People have been doing it since the beginning of time, asking questions of something greater themselves. Help, give me guidance. That's, all, that's always been there. That's not new. But what happened was just like treatment is sort of a structured form of prayer. Prayer's always been. It was just formulated into a structure. This process of visioning has become a structure that Reverend Michael Beckwith created. And I want to share how it works because there's an element that I think sometimes we forget about visioning. So he, he was doing it himself. Well, for, he was a practitioner 
with another practitioner they were, for seven years. They were doing agape love workshops all around LA with Reverend Nirvana. He's, the two of them were doing these agape love workshops. He's getting the call to be a minister, so he spends a year by himself visioning on what the ministry is that he's been called to. Asking the question, going into stillness, silence, and asking the question. And then after a year of doing that on his own, he gathers 20 people, and they meet in somebody's living room every Thursday night, 7 o'clock, and they vision every single week. What is the divine vision for this ministry? They're asking the same question week after week after week after week. Why? I'm pretty sure Reverend Michael's getting a sense of what it was the year that he, I mean, he spent a whole year on, on his own before he invited other people in it. Why would we spend so much time asking the same question over and over and over and over? Because something new is create, being created that's never been created before, and we want it to come from the depths of spirit, not just from a cool new idea. So we talk about habit patterns, and usually when we talk about habit patterns, we talk about them almost always in a negative, not always, but a lot of times negatively. Like this is a bad habit pattern, so you get into a groove and you want to change it. You want to have a new life. So you want to change it. You want to get out of that groove. I, I love the, I'm going like this because I'm thinking of a vinyl record with the, the little, the needle on the song, and then you get a scratch, and you get this habit pattern that just keeps going, and you want to move on. <laughs> move that over. And so a lot of what we talk about and what we teach is about how to shift these patterns into the new song. I want a new song. And then we get a new song. But eventually, we can just constantly have new songs, new songs, new songs, new songs. But if we want to go deep, we find a song that we really love, we really love, and we go deeply into it. Whoever wrote that song didn't just do it for two seconds. They went deeply into the song, to the vibration, to the feeling tone of it. That's what constantly asking the question is about. It's about opening to a whole new song, a whole new world that we've never seen before. And so when you're in the visioning process and you're asking the question, you're getting the answer, at least this has happened for me, I can't speak for anyone else. It's so obvious and so clear when I'm in the visioning, and then when I'm out, it's like an, it's literally another world and I can't quite remember it. So the returning and the returning is to start establishing this new song that is not part of your groove yet. You're te you're te you know, you've had peak spiritual experiences, you have a peak spiritual experience, you have a peak, but you want to have, get to the point where those peak spiritual experiences become sustained right? Don't we do that? Are you with me? Y'all staring at me. <laughs> so so, so we, 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 when we have a peak spiritual experience, it, it's a pointer. It's like, oh, I want that. And that's what gets us on our spiritual journey and gets us excited and doing our meditation and our treatment because I want to not just have the experiences. I want to start living from a higher state. Well, returning to a, with a question, we talked about earlier in the month that Somehow things move quicker when we ask questions than we just make statements. So if we make an affirmation of I am, that's powerful. But if we ask the question, who am I, that actually is more activating energetically. So by going into a meditation as they did collectively and ask a question every single week, they're activating something very deep because they're, because they're curious because they're curious. They really, they're, they want to know and they're not, and they're coming in with an to complete open available availability. And that allows this new song, to allow this new melody, to allow this new rhythm, to allow the new orchestration, allow the new voices to show up in all their multidimensional reality to become a vibrational frequency upon that becomes habitual. And that's a habit we want to keep. See, we're always going to be habit patterns. You'll never not be a habit pattern while you're on this world. So the question is, is what are the habit patterns we want to keep? And so when we continue to return to a question over and over to open ourselves up to a new world, we want to become that new world. We don't want to just get a glimpse of it, and we want it to become a habit. We want it, in order for us to sustain it, it becomes a way of being. And so that's what happened. They spent a year visioning, and then they opened up the doors. At first, they had friends and family come. They left, but then the church grew, the, grew really fast. But it didn't grow really fast because they got a good idea, and they just started something. Reverend Michael had been two years listening 
before he ever made a move externally. And when they were in this group, they didn't go around talking about it with everyone because that dissipates the energy. And a lot of mysticism, what you'll always hear is about keep it within. It's like in the womb of creation. You don't want to, people, other people who are not in that visioning process aren't, they might get the, the surface of it, but they're not going to get the depth of it because they're not there. So they didn't talk about it. But then they, when they did open up the doors, when that time came, we're ready, we open up the doors, people started coming, pouring in. And then they had to do even more work because they're, they're the, what they sound, started was the Agape Spiritual Center of Truth in Los Angeles, which means unconditional love, but they weren't feeling very unconditionally loving because they felt invaded by all these foreigners. <laughs> and so, the, so they continued to do the work. How do we keep our hearts open? Because they had created such a depth of love with each other. And now, and, and with their friends and the people who had gone to the Agape Love Work. They, had, they knew their community, but all these new people they never met before. I mean, Agape grew pretty quickly with all different types of people, with all different types of background, with all types of different understanding. And their job, so they kept meeting, was to keep their hearts open, keep their hearts open, keep their hearts open. Don't shut down. Don't create borders. Don't hang out with my little clique over here because these are the people I know, but open up. Open up. And you feel it when you go there. You know, you felt the vibration. I went to Agape and hated it when I first went because externally it was very different than my personality. It was very loud. People were jumping up and down and yelling. And I'm like, this isn't very deep. And I don't like this. So I would leave. But I kept coming back. I kept coming back. I had to be there because underneath I felt what was happening underneath. The surface isn't where we want to be. The surface, the, an the answers that come on the surface, they, they come and they go, but the, it's the depth. That's where the power is, and that's what everybody was feeling who goes. And then I went to Reverend Ellen's center down in, in San Jose, and that's a very quiet, it's, very, it's a, a good-sized center, and they, but it's very quiet. And I remember sitting there in meditation, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I felt at Agape. The externals are totally different. But once we connect, you know you're there. So you were looking at your spiritual journey, your spiritual journey. Who do you want to be on your spiritual journey? What do you want that vibrational frequency to be for you? Do people feel something when they're around you? Do they, not just because of the external, you know, there's a lot of, like I said, there, there are two totally opposite externals. But something that's even beyond the expert, the thing that's be under the tongue, not over the tongue, but under the tongue, that invisible realm that you can't see with your eyes, but you can feel with your soul. That's what a life of questioning becomes. When we look at our spiritual journey, this year is all about our spiritual journey. What are the questions that you want to have patience to have patience and faith that as you continue to ask these questions, you're going to start shifting into a vibrational frequency that you can't see now, that you haven't ever embodied before, but you're about to move into that because you're willing to continue to return, to return to this question, the most important question of who am I? What is my spiritual journey? What am I about? What is those questions for you? Do you have friends that you want to invite and join you in this process of asking questions, or do you want to keep it to yourself? Everyone's different. There's no right way. When we were at Agape, no one was allowed to start anything new unless you had visioned on it for six months. You know how hard that is? <laughs> really hard <laughs> because you get all these great ideas and I'd be like Reverend Michael this would be such a good idea and I remember one time I'm like Reverend, this would be such a good idea and he literally took his finger and put it on my third eye and he goes take it back inside <laughs> but it's such a good idea I can explain it to you why it's such a good idea no drop down and it was the best thing he ever did to me made me stop looking out there go in and so much came from just and I got a group of people together, and we started visioning together, and so much came. It was so healing because we didn't go straight to the doing, which is what we're comfortable with, and went first to the beingness. And it takes time. Six months is a long time to wait when you have a really good idea. 
and ultimately he starts to change and, and deepen and build. And he did it himself. You know, they started a men's ministry. This is after they're out at Mega Church, and they thought, oh, we want a men's ministry. And Reverend Michael said, oh, I'll do that with you. Sat with the guy for six months in vision before they ever even began opening it up to the community. There's a power to the patience when we're asking questions. One way that Reverend Michael talks about it is, I don't like the second word that he uses, but you'll get the feeling tone of it. He says, curiosity keeps us on the surface, but when we're really interested in something, we, we go deeper. I don't know if interested is the word I use, but I get that sometimes curiosity, if we're just, I'm just curious, you know, I'll Google it, or this whole inquiry on treatment is great, and I'm gonna continue on it when I leave here today, I'm gonna, because I'm thinking about it, and it's on, but it's different than deep and abiding interest. I want a new way of being. I want a new life. What are those questions? And I'm very clear what those questions are for me. Are you clear what the questions are for you to carry you through the spiritual journey? One last story about patience, just to remind us, and, it's, and this again, it's about being curious, not judgmental. So I'm not telling the story to be judgmental, but to learn from it for myself because I, I want to rush things too. I want things to happen too, very much. Reverend Nirvana, who I adore, he was the assistant minister at Agape. Just a little sense of who he is. He is a total extrovert. Loved to talk a lot. <laughs> talk to everybody a lot, full big energy. So when they were doing the Agape Love workshops for those seven years, and this is for people who may know these people, they are doing it around um, LA. Reverend Nirvana was way the leader. He was the one talking and leading, and Reverend Michael would sort of sit in the background. But as they were listening to the questions about their, this ministry that they're creating, it became clear that Reverend Michael was the one that was being called to be a minister. I don't know why this gets to me, because I love him so much. I've always loved that Reverend Nirvana never once that I, that I saw, and I had a front row seat, showed a bit of jealousy. He threw all his ebullient, extroverted, big-hearted, big energy all towards Reverend Michael. He never said, oh, I want to be, he loved to be center of attention, be very clear. Reverend Nirvana loved being center of attention, and yet when he listened to Spirit, and Spirit said, that's not your role in this community. Your role in this community is to help Reverend Michael, Whew. now that's a shift. If you love being in front of people and yet you're there to support someone else to be in front of people, and he lived that every day, that's love. That's someone who was willing to shift because they were listening to something much deeper than their own habit patterns of wanting to you know, be in front. So eventually Reverend Nirvana became um, head of education for United Church, for the United Center. And he did what he knew because he'd been part of the whole beginning of Agape, so he got a powerhouse group of people. Not just from Agape, but he had been a dean of the ministerial school, so he knew a lot of people from a lot of different centers. And so he got this great group of people, got them all together, and they started visioning on the education for the Center for Spiritual Living. And I'm saying, I don't know exactly, I'm just making up a number, but it was going on for quite some time, somewhere, so I'm just gonna use eight months. They've been going around for like eight months. Nothing's happening. No, just, he's the head. He's supposed to get things moving. Nothing's happening to people who don't understand the process. So what they're seeing is people who just come together and vision every week and don't do anything. So after a certain, after it's been going on for quite some time, they're like, okay, we actually need to start making decisions. We gotta get stuff done. So someone else took that job and started creating curriculum. And when the two <clears throat> organizations came together, that curriculum never made it. I mean, it was okay, the curriculum. There's a billion experientials we can do. And, and the person who made them, I love. So that's why this isn't about judgment. I'm not out here to judge. I'm here to be curious because I'm actually not that different sometimes. Like, let's get stuff done. But there, and, and we should, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that because once you move, you move and you move a lot and with passion and everyone's participating and it's awesome and it's great. So it's not about not moving. That's the out loud part. Oh yeah, it's gonna, we're getting, we're getting everybody involved. 
but it's also about the listening and how uncomfortable that can be. When I'm feeling uncomfortable in this next two months, we're going into the month of authenticity for next month and the month after that is vulnerability. And one of the things that I notice is that when I'm feeling uncomfortable, I want to do something about it because I'm so f uncomfortable. And to just simply be in it and to say, I don't know what to do or to say, so I'm just gonna be with it. I'm gonna be with it in the divine love. I'm just gonna hold it in my heart to be with it. I don't know what to do. That is so hard for us as human beings. It's hard for me. I want to do something because it's uncomfortable. Is anyone else like that? Well, it's, it's just, you know, it's, especially when we come up with really good ideas to fix something. I'm really good at coming up with good ideas to fix things, but they never last. No, that's not true. I'm just learning for myself, whether it's your, um, whatever we're in, to stay in it, to not rush things. I was sharing with the foundations class. I had taken foundations class myself, and then I started TAing when Reverend Mike, I didn't have Reverend Mike as a teacher, and then I went to Agape, and I would TA when he was teaching it. Exact same curriculum. But the thing that he do, did was start every class with 15 minute meditation. Everything was just dropped down into the silence, into this quiet. I'm like, wow, just that one little thing, just dropping things down, just Every exercise, okay, let's just be still for a minute. Let's not just jump into the exercise, let's just be still for a minute. Everything he did, he started with, okay, let's just be still for a minute. It's such a beautiful gift to give ourselves. And so as we're moving forward, and I just wanna end with one, just sort of clarify also one thing because people have asked us about the idea of visioning. Sometimes when we're visioning, there's an idea too that we're just waiting. We're waiting for something, but to really know that, yes, sometimes it's intuitional, but you will get images and to be comfortable receiving images or sounds. I think sometimes we get so into the, the vastness of the invisibility that we, we feel like it's bad to get real clear signs. So, so I look at it, the difference between guided meditation. So a guided meditation is where I will tell you, or the facilitator will say, oh, you're now in a beach and there's this warm ocean lapping up into the sands and you're just lying in the beach and resting and you feel the seagulls above and the blue sky and the, you know, right? So that's a guided meditation where we're creating the imagery. The, the imagery is getting created for you. That's a guided meditation, that's a guided visualization. A guided imagery, I learned from Dr. Martin Rossman when I was in ministerial school, and he was a doctor, and he, he started coming across, especially chronic pain, things that were hard for people to heal and cure. So he did something called guided imagery, which was slightly different. Again, get people into a place of stillness, and then he'd say, okay, you're in a place where you feel really safe. What does it look like? What does it sound like? Like, he wouldn't give you the images. He's asking you, he's inviting you to allow those images to come forth. You feel safe with somebody. Who would that be? He did a lot of stuff with the body because he worked with a lot of people with chronic pain. So I remember, I can't, I just remember there's somebody with a shoulder and it was like, he said, well, what's the image? Like, what's the image that your body's trying to, your shoulder's trying to reveal? And they had this hard metal image. And then as he said, now talk to that image. Like, what's it trying to tell you? This amazing stuff came out of where that metal shoulder came from, imagery. And it suddenly all got healed. There's so much wisdom through imagery, but not imagery we force upon it, but imagery we allow. So even as I'm talking about visioning, sometimes it can be so abstract, but I wanna say it's not abstract. It's very real and tangible. It's us asking and allowing. And so even as you're asking, what's the vision for my life or whatever question you are asking for yourself or your spiritual journey, you can ask, and what does that vision feel like in my body? How do I hold that? Where, where do I feel the passion for this vision in my body? Where do I feel resistance in my body? That makes it, takes it down into form, so it's not all like way up abstractness, right? Do we get that? So it starts to become real and alive. So as we go forth into our beautiful 
rest of the year. I invite us to say, what are those questions that I really, that, that feel, have a, a feeling, I feel a, 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 a physical connection to these questions. They're not just in my head, a deep, and I'm willing to ask these questions for an entire year. Like, even if I keep getting the same answer, I'm just going to keep asking, because it's okay. I'm going to go back and ask again, and I'm going to go back and ask it again, because I want to create, open up to this whole new song that I've never experienced before. I want to become this new song and have that new song, this new state of consciousness, become my living reality on a daily and consistent basis, not just a visit. I don't want to just visit this song. I want this to be this song. And these questions that I'm asking are helping me move into this new world to allow these images from the divine to come forth and imagine into existence this new world, not just externally, but in consciousness. Oh, I, I did, oh my God, oh, I did go longer than I wanted. <laughs> I was gonna tell one more story like, because it just came to me recently. Because I've told the story before, but I understand it a little bit differently now. I've talked about when one time when I was in ministerial school, I was asked to talk, uh, interview people who start in a new church. I had no thought of ever starting a new church, but that was what the teacher assigned me. And so I went to one minister. She had started a church right after graduating. Within three or four years, it dissolved. She was exhausted and blah, blah, blah. Then I went to Reverend Michael and interviewed him. And again, this is how I learned all about, I knew about the visioning stuff already. But the, the questions that I was given by the minister were very logistical. Like, okay, you need to become a 5013C, you need to have a board, you need to have bylaws, all this stuff. Giving praise and thanks to the, to the board of the lighthouse who did all this incredible work of paper, you know, just all the things, all the boxes to check. Insurance liability, you know, everything. It takes a lot to keep this beautiful, wonderful community going, loving the board. So I'm just asking him these questions. We didn't pray when we met. This wasn't a spiritual meeting. I wasn't asking him anything. I was just going through the questions, and he's telling me who did the bylaws, who was in charge of this, of the group of 20 people. They all had different roles. But as he's talking, moving way beyond body-mind identity, we are just in this vastness, and it's so freeing and alive, and I'm just, and I'm thinking, wait, we didn't even pray or meditate, and we're not even talking about spiritual things. <laughs> How did we get here? Because I spent other time with Michael where it wasn't like that. But then it just dawned on me, oh, I'm talking with him about the beginning of agape, and he spent so much time in this expanded state of consciousness at the beginning of it that he's just gone back. He's just right there again. He's right in that expanded state of consciousness that he had so firmly established through these years of visioning and visioning that as I'm talking about what the foundation of what agape is, we're right there. We're right there in consciousness. It doesn't leave. It's eternal. So whatever shift that you're making, it's eternal. And when we might forget, or it's easy to return to because we've established this new way of being. That was the last story I wanted to tell. <laughs> just because it's so exciting to me. It's exciting that it's, so, it's just so real and so awesome. And, we, and, it's, and it's possible for every single one of us. We just have to choose. We just have to be curious enough to make this choice and be curious of what it's going to look like if we do this every single week until the end of the year. So I'm going to be checking in with you in December. Yeah? Yippee! All right, well, let's pray. Let's do one of those treatments I'm talking about. <laughs> Y'all ready? So I'm going to start with, because I heard this yesterday, I didn't know it, so just for fun. Some t uh, Ernest Holmes like to start treatments with gratitude. Learn that new one. Oh, another one, just for all of you who do this a lot. Turns out he, um, when he met with people one-on-one, -on -one, he did all his treatment work silently. He didn't say that loud. You knew that? I didn't know that. All right. Well, we're not going to be silent today. We're dancing, feeling the energy. And we're just giving great gratitude, deep and abiding thanks. 
that we are turning to this consciousness of oneness, to this consciousness of peace, this consciousness of wholeness, this consciousness of light, this consciousness of love, and how grateful I am to join with everybody that is sitting here today and online with beautiful spiritual communities of all kinds all over the planet. We're just joining everybody. There's no walls. There's no separation. There's no us versus them. There is all of us now, here and now. How grateful I am to know this, to be in this conscious awareness with my beautiful friends here this morning. So let us just feel gratitude just to be where we are in this moment. No judgment, just gratitude. And from this deep abiding gratitude, we just give thanks to know and feel and experience and awaken to this one power, this one presence, this always already enlightened self that is alive and awake. It never is unconscious. It is never forgetful of who and what it is. It is always alive as every atom and cell of all creation, of all creation, of all phenomena, of energy, of light, of galaxies upon galaxies, of dark matter, of nebulae, of suns and moons and planets and stars and galaxies, of this beautiful radiant earth, of all the different forms of this incredible, extraordinary earth in which we walk the desert and the tropical, the ocean and the mountains, every leaf, every blade of grass. And we feel that incredible, extraordinary vibrational frequency, this love, this light, this beingness as our very body, every atom and cell of our body is pulsating and radiating as light. That is who it is always, it never stops. There is a consciousness that radiates in through and as every organ and action and function of our body all of the time. We turn and rest into that absolute truth of who and what we are. Behind all the human experiences is this one life, this one power, and we are it. We identify with ourselves with it. We identify with this oneness, this pure light, this absolute light of love that doesn't come and that doesn't go and that is intelligent and kind and infinitely harmonious and beautiful. This is who we are and who all beings are. And so let us just breathe into this awareness that there's nothing else happening in this world, this universe, in the absolute, other than this one power, this one love, this one presence. as you feel yourself, as you hear music, as different images come into your mind of different people, thoughts, just hold behind all of that is this oneness. Bless everything with this consciousness of oneness. There's nothing other, there's nothing other. There's no place to go to make it more perfect. There's nothing to do right now in this moment to make it more perfect other than just simply being. Simply be. And we trust and we have faith and we have patience in this beingness, knowing that every step of the way every step of the way we are loved we are guided we are protected we are shown the way forward to become more fully alive and awake as this one power in this one presence we are living the dawn of a new day simply by being still we are inviting it into our room our inner room the secret room of the most high we invite it in and we let it flourish in our interior consciousness. We let this new life, this dawn of the new day, allow it to have a new life and we allow its imaginings to break us free into worlds that we haven't yet to experience but we know is possible. We allow that imagining to carry us forward in joy, in gratitude, and in unbelievable awe. 
We are that new life. We are that new life. We imagine it, we see it, we feel it, we accept it, and it is done. And so it is. I walk in God in all that I say.